In this video I'll be going out on a limb and making some wild speculations, although by the standards of Templar conspiracies these will be relatively tame. I make no claims to expertise on this issue, and I would invite the viewer to treat this video as just one attempt to connect some dots in the mystery of the Order of the Temple of Solomon and its strange history in the Middle Ages. At the very least, perhaps these theories would be a good basis for a work of historical fiction. With that disclaimer out of the way, let us open with some remarks from the highly speculative historian Joseph P. Farrell in his book Thrice Great Hermetica and the Janus Age. He outlines just some of the reasons these topics are so fascinating and tantalising in their obscurity. As he puts it, no understanding of modern Europe is possible without a consideration of the Templars, for they constitute the first recognisable international military industrial intelligence finance complex and the first full-time standing professional European army since the fall of the Western Roman Empire. A kind of extraterritorial United Europe bureaucracy and an international conglomerate and armaments cartel, its extra-jurisdictional and extraterritorial status thus constitutes it as a breakaway group, a state within all states. The rise of international banking with all that implies, including the probable creation of methods of modern accounting, which would have been held as a proprietary secret of the order. Given the close alliance and association of the Templar orders with Venice, it is also possible that double entry accounting, usually reckoned as an invention of the Venetians, may have had a secret origin within the Templars. The matrix of alliances within which the trading empires of Venice and Genoa arose, since Venice and Genoa were responsible for constructing the fleets of the international crusading orders, the Templars and Hospitallers. Thus the dramatic expansion of the international commerce of the city-states is not possible to understand without these orders. The formation of an international group whose covert purpose was the recovery and hidden transmission of lost knowledge, inclusive of hidden cartographic traditions. Transformation of European culture and the rise of commerce. For the militant crusading orders, especially the Templars, made possible the safe transport of people and goods and the intergenerational accumulation of capital and equity. The Templar order is also, viewed with modern lenses, a radical corporate socialism since it also abjures individual property, but allows property for the order. One particular aspect I want to draw attention to in this video is the remarkable innovation the Templars introduced to banking in the medieval West, that is, the notion of the promissory note. In my view, this is an innovation which is sometimes overlooked in accounts of the Templars. Indeed, sometimes in efforts to piece together a narrative historians overlook the obvious. Farrell, in suggesting that the absence of gold from Templar fortresses following their dissolution could imply advanced knowledge of the dissolution of the order, certainly gives a plausible answer, but I want to offer the alternative hypothesis that there was no such gold in the first place, or at least only a fraction of the purported quantity. In this tentative hypothesis, and somewhat anachronistically, I want to propose that the Templars had hit upon the notion of employing something like a fractional reserve in their banking practices. Obviously this is a large claim, which would subtly alter our understanding of the chronology of developments in banking, but I do not think that it is all that implausible. Rather, as a closely guarded secret of the order, knowledge of such an idea would have been largely suppressed even following their dissolution. Nevertheless, the principles could have passed on to certain individuals and been kept underground until the large-scale emergence of fractional reserve banking in the later eras of financial capitalism. After all, given the ingenuity of Templar promissory notes or checks simply as a concept, it does not seem a great leap to suppose that they might have explored just some of the many ramifications of a fiat currency, simply in terms of creating monetary value out of nothing unsupported by any concrete gold or silver supply. These concepts are familiar to us now, but surely did not emerge fully fledged at some singular, decisive moment in history. Rather, it seems credible to suppose that such practices developed slowly over time, in fits and starts, perhaps enjoying wider application in brief windows of time 
and in select areas of opportunity, such as were open to the Knights Templar at the height of their powers. Indeed, the notion of fiat currency may not have been unknown to the West even at this early time. After all, the use of paper money was an established practice in China for centuries prior to the adventures of Marco Polo, during which he observed that all these pieces of paper issued with as much solemnity and authority as if they were of pure gold or silver, and indeed everybody takes them readily, for wheresoever a person may go throughout the great Khan's dominions, he shall find these pieces of paper current, and shall be able to transact all sales and purchases of goods by means of them just as well as if they were coins of pure gold. These travels of Marco Polo took place in the latter decades of the 13th century, ending just a few years before the dissolution of the Order of the Temple. Perhaps this is significant. Could it be that aspects of the Chinese system had already long been known to the Templars and inspired their own secretive banking practices? If the hypothesis of this video is to hold up, I think this is quite possible. Contact and exchange with China could have been going on long before Marco Polo travelled there. In his book on the Crusades, Hans Eberhard Meyer speaks of a Franciscan presence in China, noting that the most impressive testimony of these tiny Chinese communities in the Far East is the tombstone of Catherine Viglioni, who died in 1342 in Yangchao, north of Nanking. The local Franciscans composed the Latin funerary inscription but the artist who depicted the martyrdom of St. Catherine, giving both her and her torturers Chinese features, was obviously Chinese, though presumably baptised. The historian Lauren Arnold has posited a connection between Catherine Viglioni with a merchant named Pietro Viglioni, who was involved in trade in Tabriz in 1264. Tabriz had been conquered by the Kingdom of Georgia, and subsequently by the Mongols, and was indeed a trading hub with the Far East, through which Marco Polo passed on his travels. A Chinese influence is not necessarily involved here, but these reports certainly testify to the fact that, by the turn of the 14th century, there was an increasing amount of knowledge about diverse banking practices and economic systems. Perhaps the Templars were simply ahead of the curve, especially in their accounting practices, as Farrell suggests. This emphasis on diversity leads us to another important point. The Templars' financial affairs need not have been dominated by a single principle like the gold standard. Indeed, it would be anachronistic to apply such a kind of monolithic conception to the medieval economy. There were various recognised sources of value, and these were intricately interwoven with the social order of feudal society and church hierarchy. With the Templars, nevertheless, we find an uneasy mixture of authority both ecclesiastical and feudal, and secrecy, such that what I am referring to as a fractional reserve approach to their gold use could just as easily be called a practice of deceit and conscious dissimulation by men who believed they were above the law. Moreover, when we consider the size of the order, its breadth of influence in European and overseas affairs in the 13th century, we can see a corporation with a great deal of inertia, so to speak, a quality which alone could have helped to inspire trust in their financial security. This fact, of course, makes the sudden collapse of the order all the more peculiar and inexplicable. That is, unless we consider the apparent security of the order to have been something like an inflated balloon, promising to the eye more than was really there. This economic dimension, I think, ties in also with the charges of witchcraft against the order. After all, the creation of value from nothing, as would be entailed by such practices, could easily have been perceived as a kind of witchcraft or hermeticism. When considering why, if they were really issuing credit and monies they didn't actually possess, the economy did not progress at the rate we would later see in the periods of mercantilism and financial capitalism, it is important to note the various factors acting as limitations on the medieval economy. The most obvious and significant limitation, besides certain political factors we shall touch on, is the lack of technological development. Although by the 13th century breakthroughs had been made with the introduction of water mills, 
They were nowhere near the kinds of labour-saving devices that would be introduced by the Industrial Revolution, and the Agricultural Revolution still lay centuries in the future. Another obvious factor inhibiting the growth of the economy was the social stratification itself, which ensured that the demand for foreign goods was largely restricted to the aristocracy and to royalty. The vast majority of the population could not afford the luxury goods made available by merchants from the East. The difficulty of travel likewise ensured that these goods would remain expensive, if only due to the number of middlemen necessarily involved in such ventures as the exportation of spices from the Far East. Prior to the periods of exploration in the Elizabethan era, there were not the clearly established trade routes that would come to define the period of commercial capitalism and mercantilism. With the notable exception of the Crusades, social life was fairly static for most classes in the medieval era. As we have seen, however, it is not that trade routes were unknown, but they were fraught with dangers which would perhaps only be mitigated with the advent of firearms and the superior ships of the Elizabethan era. The Templars themselves were, from this perspective, part of an initiative to open up safer travel and pilgrimage in the Middle East at the very least, but with limited success. This brings us to another perplexing detail that Farrell points out in his book, writing, One would think that there would be a certain obvious disposition of Templar finances, since the whole purpose of the financial aspect of the order was to finance the massive expenses incurred by Middle Eastern crusading. Thus one should expect, as a general pattern, that the order should have been relatively Europe poor and Middle East rich, since supposedly liquid capital in the form of coins and bullion would be constantly flowing from Europe to the Middle East to support the effort. But as it turns out, circa 1218, during the Templar campaign in Egypt, almost the exact opposite was the case. Despite their general wealth in Europe, the Templars in the Holy Land seemed perpetually broke. In a letter to the Bishop of Ely in England, the Grand Master Peter de Montague boasted about the successful campaign against Damietta and vividly described a series of sea battles between the Templar and Egyptian fleets along the coast of Palestine. But the last paragraph of the Grand Master's letter revealed his real reason for writing. De Montague predicted, If we are disappointed of the succour we expect in the ensuing summer, all our newly acquired conquests, as well as the places that we have held for ages past, will be left in a very doubtful condition. We ourselves are so impoverished by the heavy expenses we have incurred in prosecuting the affairs of Jesus Christ that we shall be unable to contribute the necessary funds unless we speedily receive succour and subsidies from the faithful. The modern reader is left to wonder why the Grand Master didn't solicit funds from his own treasure houses in Europe since the western branches of the order made loans to so many other applicants throughout its history. The order may have remained so rich in the west because it failed to finance its members in the East. This is a point to which we will return at the end of this video, but it is worth raising now nevertheless, since it certainly ties in with the themes we have been addressing so far. Venetian influence If we were to piece together something of a narrative, we could explain the meteoric rise of the Templars by appealing to their innovations in banking and the desire of the various princes of Europe to secure their interests in the Holy Land. They were also instrumental in the Reconquista in Spain and operated a great deal more effectively there than in Outremer, it appears. Perhaps buoyed up by the hubris of their own success, the knights began to overextend themselves in terms of overspending and depleting the reserves of gold entrusted to them by their patrons. When these same investors came to claim their gold back, assuming they did not merely receive some services, lands or goods in exchange. This would have escalated the problem. Here I speculate, the order could have turned to the Venetians and made up the lack by borrowing quantities of gold in order to pay back those who had deposited gold or goods in the first place. Naturally, this would have placed the order into debt with the Venetian bankers, and when this debt reached a critical point, the solution of a fourth crusade could have been planned not against the heathens, but against the wealthy so-called schismatics in Constantinople. In summary, I propose that the Fourth Crusade 
was coordinated by Venice and the Order of the Temple in order to pay off debts by means of acquiring capital. This did not take the form of gold bullion primarily, but satisfied the medieval appetite for sacred relics. These were an important part of the medieval economy among the elite classes, as Meyer explains. Of course, the Templars would also be able to set up a Frankish king in Constantinople, once it was captured, and thereby pay off one of their debts via bestowing political favour. The success of this campaign could have bolstered the reputation of the Templars, without, alas, correcting their acquisitive and over-ambitious tendencies. Their overreach, prompting envy and indignation from the King of France, eventually led to their infamous dissolution by the Pope. Given this theory, that they only held in reserve a fraction of the monetary value they claimed, the strange lack of gold in their great fortresses following their dissolution could be explained without recourse to the theory that large quantities of gold were moved ahead of time or hidden away by mysterious forces. It could also help to explain the absence of written records of the Templars' accounts. Such a large-scale operation would certainly have required meticulous bookkeeping and would have been kept very secret for obvious reasons. Finally, the relative failure of the Templars in Outremer compared to their efforts in Europe may serve as another key to this whole mysterious period of history. Perhaps the entire crusading venture was ultimately a mere bait and switch by which the order could seize land in Europe, ostensibly to support their holy mission. This does not require the support of the other hypotheses put forward in this video, but it does harmonise with them nicely. <laughs>